have unlocked the eternal link to internal source. The key of imagination, your admission. Access to the enlightened dimension. A gateway at the junction of darkness and light. The place at which the chaos of our conditioned frame of mind give way to a life in constant flux, only to be mastered through vigilant discipline. Peaceful times may come, testing times may go. This is the ebb and flow. Hey everybody, welcome to the Ebb and Flow podcast. I'm your host, Eben Britton. I hope you guys are staying safe and staying sane out there in this crazy time we find ourselves in. Today, I have an excellent guest, a guy I'm really excited to have on the show. He's a best-selling author. He's the founder of Forbidden Knowledge on Instagram. Billy Carson, welcome to the show, my brother. Hey, thank you for having me, man. It's good to be here. Absolutely, man. Well, Billy, you know, I feel like in some ways I'm talking to the real life Morpheus. <laughs> and, uh, Let me put my glasses on then. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. Um, I, I appreciate so much uh, what you do on Forbidden Knowledge and uh, your take on the world and the origin of man. Um, I myself, a few years ago, stumbled upon the Emerald Tablets and Thoth. And, you know, I dove deep into hermetic alchemy and really found that, you know, this is an ancient universal truth, you know, that this, these sacred teachings are built on. And you really dive into sort of, you know, where all of this stuff comes from. Um, So I'd love to start with, you know, first of all, how did you get into this? And sort of what was your path to coming upon this? You know, you're you're a light spreader, man. You're a truth teller, a truth seeker, um, and in a world filled with uh, very biased views and information, and uh, very uh, sort of compromised information being put out into the world because of politics and you know uh, capitalism corruption. I think that, you know, it's important that we have views of the world outside of what our mainstream media is pumping out. And so I'd love to hear how you came to this. Yeah, definitely. Um, And first, let me apologize to your fans for the little bit of rain noise that's going on. I wasn't able to make it back to my studio due to some very bad weather out here. Um, But we're going to make it work, man, because the truth has to get out no matter what. Absolutely. Uh, So basically, to be honest with you, from the time I was very young, I always knew I was a little bit different than um, some of the other kids that, you know, my siblings, first of all, my brother, who's only one year younger than me, uh, very intelligent now and very smart. At the time that we were very small, I noticed that I was understanding things differently. I was already reading uh, books, like real books by the age of one. I was reading children's books at 10 months and walking at 10 months. By one years old, I was already reading real adult books, you know, um, actual novels. The first Mm. book that I read was uh, The Sea Wolf by Jack London. Wow. It's still my favorite book to this very day. Uh, You know, so I had a pretty good aptitude. It was so much so that my father would take me to the bars that he would hang out at at two, three o'clock in the morning with all his uh, drunk buddies and make me recite quotes out of the Bible and read the Lord's Prayer and recite the the 23rd Psalm and all these crazy things. And then he'd come home and my mom would pop him upside the head. But (laughs) Um, so I knew I was always a little bit different. Um, by the time I was, uh, seven, we moved to, um, Opelika, Florida in Miami. And we lived close to the Opelika airport. And I used to go out in the backyard and watch the little private planes fly over, you know? Hmm. And I would just out of boredom. I mean, you you gotta remember this is 1970s. There's no, there's only three or four channels on TV. There's no cartoon network. There's no video games. Nothing exists. There wasn't even a Atari 2600 didn't even exist yet. Okay. Wow. So you, you gotta go outside for fun and I'm outside watching these planes and for fun, I'm just counting how long it takes for them to clear the horizon. Hmm. So one day I went out there and I'm observing the planes go over and this object comes over and it's not an airplane. Hmm. Now, I didn't know about UFOs, aliens. I didn't know about uh, all this stuff we see on TV nowadays. I just knew that what I saw didn't have a tail, a cockpit, 
wings or anything like that. And uh, I was like, wow, what is that? And it came across the horizon and it cleared the horizon in seconds, not minutes. Mm. When I said, wow, and look back and try to track where it went, it flew back and it came right back, almost directly above me, with, you know, just slightly off, but about 250 meters right above me. And it was this oval orb, not, not a round circular disc, but more oval. But the glowing exterior, you could see through that it was something metal in there. It was, it was something metal, metallic, a real mm. thing. And it took off the way that it came in just as fast as it was clearing. And all I did was I, I said, wow. I went running in the house. I went trying to find somebody to talk to. My brother was playing games and stuff, Legos or whatever. He really didn't care. I went to uh, Rainbow Park Elementary the next day. Um, and at Rainbow Park Elementary, I got all the Encyclopedia Britannicas on aerospace. Hmm. But I started researching and from the Encyclopedia Britannica all the aerospace in 1977. Hmm. That's when I started. Wow, dude! So, so you were you kind of came in, you dropped in, and and were tapped into uh, this this type of you had a thirst for this knowledge. Yeah, like right out the gate. I had a serious thirst for it. Um, I remember telling my mom, you know, after I went and sold all my toys in the neighborhood. Uh, because I was t- tired of being so broke, not having any money for anything. I told my mom, don't, don't buy me any more toys. All I want is schematic boards. Uh, I want uh, <laughs> uh, soldering guns, <laughs> I love LED it, lights, uh, so, you know, and tools and stuff. And that's, you know, that's what I really, and then she got me, I said, get me a whole bunch of books. She got me biology books. Then about three weeks after I told her that, the, uh, the encyclopedia sales person came knocking at our door. And she got approved for a full set of encyclopedias, and I was in heaven then. That was it for me. I just dove into those books. Everything, every topic, I read every single one of those encyclopedias multiple times. Dude, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that speaks to, you know, your knowledge of ancient history, et cetera. Um, so I, I want to, man, so I, I want to talk about, you know, this, this, um, your, your presentation of, or your sort of translation of the origins of man. Yeah. And, you know, you've really done this beautiful job of taking ancient texts and mythologies, the Bible, the Quran, all the, the various religious books and teachings Mm -hmm. And you've really kind of put um, an explanation to them, or you've you've yeah. sort of taken them out of the context of being sort of fairy tales. And how can these be uh, explained um, in reality? And I yeah. want you to go into sort of the history of man, the origins of man. I read this yeah. book a few years ago that came out. Everybody was, you know, this was like all over the news. Everyone was, you mm-hmm. know praising this book sapiens yeah okay have you have you read sapiens yes yeah sapiens yes absolutely (laughs) and i felt you know i read the book and you know i felt it was very pedestrian yeah like i didn't think that he did that good of a job explaining the transition or the evolution Mm -hmm. of man i thought there were a lot of holes in it like how did we go from for instance and this was the biggest thing in my mind how did we go from Hunter, tra- hunter gatherer tribes, yeah. cavemen coming out of you know coming out of the darkness into the light, mm-hmm. beginning to lose t- use tools, hunt, gather, etc. To building the pyramids, building the Sphinx, yeah. you know, creating civilization, etc. Mm-hmm. It didn't really add up to me. So yeah. I'm curious, like, what's your take on that, and and you know the things that you've written in your books etc yeah where did we come from and how did we get here yeah well you know the interesting thing about that book is he tries to paint the picture of a a homo sapien sapien achieving all of these accomplishing all these things you have to really he didn't do enough research into the ancient text to find out what the ancients had to say one thing i think that people Mm, good point neglect to do is go into these texts because um, they're afraid of what they're going to find. And it's going to take them away from the path that they want to uh, 
portray or the agenda that they want to put out uh, or their theory that they have so locked in on that they don't want to divert from, you know? And uh, unfortunately, that has been the downfall of a lot of researchers. I know. I hope it's not getting too loud for you. No, no, your voice is good, man. Your voice is okay, good. Okay, great, perfect. So basically, um, we like there's people that come and, you know, they want to <clears throat> dispute Zachariah Sitchin or this guy or that guy. And I go, well, <clears throat> Zachariah Sitchin didn't translate the Sumerian tablets. Oh, yeah, he's the only person who knew how to translate. I'm like, where where'd you get that from? <laughs> where did you actually see that written? Where is it written that Zachariah Sitchin was the only person that translated Sumerian tablets? They can't tell you. You know why? Because it's written nowhere. Zachariah Sitchin didn't translate any tablets. Interesting. All he did was he got tablets that had been translated 200 years before he was born. <clears throat> mm. uh, you know, Austin Layard from the, uh, the you know, the, um, the library of Ashurbanipal, where they found all these tablets in Iraq. And uh, in all these other tablets have now been found all over the world. So I decided, you know what, I need to become an expert on these tablets. I need to go into this information and read it. And what I started to find out was when you read the Emerald Tablets, the Sumerian Tablets, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Indian Vedas, uh, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, all of a sudden you start seeing this picture, this global international picture, all telling the same exact story Interesting. with slight differences in it. So I said, I really need to spend a lot of time understanding exactly what these people had to say because you have to realize back then, life was so hard that when you took the time to spend to write down these, uh, this information onto stone, clay, and everything else, yeah. you really had something important to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, sure. You're not going to be like, yeah, I'm going to take the next six months and it's just fabricated story yeah. you know, when I could be out here hunting and getting some food for my family. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and another interesting thing that I found was in all of these stories, they were always, for the most part, except for Thoth's work, issued to a scribe, a scribe to, to write from a dictator. The, dic mm. the person would dictate to a scribe, this god, this Anunnaki god, this Atlantean, this Greek god. It was always, no matter where you go, a god dictating to a person. So what I found was that in the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, and also in the Atreasis epic, these two tablets, tablets of writing, work, works of writings. Where do they come they go, from? They come from Iraq, both of them. Okay. Sumerians? They come from Iraq, Sumerians, yes. Okay. Now, what's interesting about these writings is um, they, did, they tell you how the entire solar system was created. Okay. They go into planetary physics and orbits and uh, collisions of planets in space and uh, they talk about this planet named Tiamat, which rivaled the sun's glory. It had so much water on it that when the sun reflected off it, it rivaled the sun's glory. Wow. Uh, and this is from their perspective of viewing it from a moon or another planet in our solar system. Earth didn't even exist yet at this time. Mm. They also talk about a captured brown dwarf star of our own solar system, gravitationally captured, that had planets orbiting it. Uh, and now science, mainstream science has finally admitted this exists. We have another sun in our solar system. It's a brown dwarf star with six planets orbiting it. It's in the inner Oort cloud, and it orbits our sun every 4,200 years, just like wow. the Sumerians said. So this thing is real. Now, back then, as it was capturing and getting its more locked-in orbit, there was a collision between some of its satellites, which are these planets, and Tiamat, which broke Tiamat into pieces. And uh, that's what we have now is the asteroid belt. Before that, it was uh, Venus. It was Mercury, Venus, and then uh, Tiamat. Mars and our moon were, were moons of this Tiamat planet. Hmm. They were moons, habitable moons. This is why the moon we have now doesn't have any, any biological material from Earth on it, even though it was supposedly, according to mainstream, a collision that happened. There was never a collision with, with our planet and the moon. What did Absolutely. happen was a giant piece of this Tiamat broke off and swung into orbit where we are right now, recoalesced with all the organic materials that were already on this Tiamat planet, which had life on it. It was a life-bearing planet and became the Earth. The hmm. rest of the chunks became the asteroid belt, and one chunk became this other planet we have called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. You have, people don't know about this planet, you have uh, Mercury. Venus, Earth, 
Mars, which captured its own orbit after losing the planet it was orbiting. So that's why Mars is a very strange elliptical orbit around the sun because it was, it was flung out after Tiamat exploded. And then you have another planet right after Mars called Ceres. Then you have the asteroid belt. Then you have the outer planets. So this planet Ceres also, because it was a piece of this, uh, this Tiamat planet, it has the most fresh water than any planet in our solar system, even more fresh water on it than Earth. Wow. But you don't hear them talking about that on the news every day. <laughs> <laughs> when they did a flyby a few years ago, the lights were on on the planet, lights. Hmm. So they tried to say, well, maybe uh, these lights, these organized patterned lights were uh, reflective ice particles. But then when they got to the back side of it and it was the dark side, the lights were still on with no sun. Mm. So there's people living on Sirius. But the, I say that story to tell you this, is that um, human beings were uh, not here originally. As this planet recoalesced, there's a couple of things that could have happened. Now, the story that coming out, the Aboriginal people, uh -huh. uh, that is, I just came from Australia. I just sat with Aboriginal elders. Their story, their handed down history is that Homo sapiens, or, or not really sapiens, but a hominid, including them also, were seeded to this planet. Were brought here and dropped off when this planet healed itself. Hmm. Um, and then they were able to procreate and, Billy, you know, kind of... Let me, yeah. So Aboriginals, mm -hmm. recently it's come out scientifically, they don't share DNA with any other human racial group on the planet, That's correct? Right. right. That's correct. Not only do they not share the, the group, but there's also a, a country uh, area of Asia called Melanesia, where you have these extremely black Asian people that live there, darker than me, like, I mean, black, black. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and they have no DNA as well, you know, as, as, as the rest of the world as well. They have this unique DNA from a, it's matched up to this new hominid that they just discovered, to, uh, let me think, three or four years ago, actually, now, uh, in that region. And their DNA is going with that hominid with an elongated skull and not the rest of the people on the planet. Very strange. Wow. You know, so it's, it's a very isolated DNA groups right there. Right. And there were even more. But they started interbreeding with some of the other hominids on the planet. Now, when the Anunnaki arrived here about 450,000 years ago, they saw our cousins here. Uh -huh. Those were, they weren't Homo sapiens sapiens. They were a different hominid species here on the planet, already evolving, already doing their thing already seeded on this planet. And then as they began to do labor on this planet and mine this planet for resources, there was going to be a battle of war against the Anunnaki working class and the, and the leaders. The okay. leaders of this, um, this whole thing had placed some EGG working class Anunnaki. This is according to the Enuma Elish on this Mars. This is in the tablet. This is in the tablets, man. <laughs> the Sumerian fucking tablets break this whole story down. Break it all down. I mean, all the way down. People living on Mars, you know, I mean, and, and then getting tired of the hard work and the labor. And Mars had a, uh, what they call a wounded atmosphere. So that means it was already poor conditions up there. Mm. They left Mars and they came down to Earth to go to war. These are the sons of God that fell from heaven. Oh. That's what it really means in the book of Genesis. Uh -huh. They came from Mars, which is heaven, considered by earthlings, to Earth. They fell down, coming down yeah. to Earth. They went to uh, Africa, uh, where the place called Adam's Calendar is the place that they went to, which was discovered recently. And the gold mines there are exactly 200,000 years old, which is the exact time frame that the Anunnaki were going to have this battle. Why? Because... The, uh, the battle was going to happen, and then Enki, one of the leaders, the king of yeah. Earth, uh, well, like the assistant to the king of Earth, Enlil was his brother who was really ruling. He was like the assistant, even though Earth was named after Enki. Uh, and he said, I have an idea. What we'll do is we will genetically modify the existing hominid on this planet. We'll add our essence to them, and we'll make them the worker slave and take the load off of ourselves. So the agreement was made, and, and then the Ijiji said, and by the way, that's acceptable, but we're taking some women with us because we have no women up there. Mm. So these are the sons of God that made it with the daughters of men. Okay. They took women with them back to Mars and yep. other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world on, uh, on Earth as well. Uh, when they made it with them, they gave birth to the Nephilim. Okay, okay. That's where I thought, yeah. yeah. Right, right. But so 
they decided then, so what happened? They started initially with cloning. This is all in the tablets. They started cloning the hominids to, to replicate them faster and get more workers. But there was a couple of issues. They weren't listening. They were hard to control. And they couldn't pro the clones couldn't procreate. Huh. It was costing more time and energy it was into cloning than it was into just doing the work themselves. So one of the, one of the Anunnaki goddesses, female, she said, I'm going to take the baby myself. I'm going to have give birth to one myself. She took a hominid, took the egg out of the woman, cleaned out some of the genetic material, added the Anunnaki genetic material. This, in modern terms right now, in modern science, we call this creating a zygote and then putting artificial insemination. She put it in her womb, and she took the baby to term for 10 months, and then there's a famous cylinder scroll in the British Museum with her holding up the first man, and she says, my hands have created it, the first Adamu, which means first man. Wow. And uh, so the, she created the Adamu through this artificial insemination and this zygote genetic modification, creating the homo sapien sapien. Then they, so they took this Adamu, raised him up, they tried to get him to mate with some of the existing people that were already on this planet. Now, how we know there were people on the planet is when you go into the Bible, it exposes the fact that there were already people here because in the book of Genesis, you have Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve. Okay? Uh -huh. What happens is they're in this Eden garden, which is really an um, a laboratory, outdoor laboratory, and Cain uh, decides to kill his brother Abel because Enlil is a, is a vegetarian. Okay, mm -hmm. because in Lil's like they're taking their best offering. So uh, Abel was over the over the uh, vegetables and herbs and spices, and so his offering was always vegetables and herbs. And Cain was over the animals, so his offering was always dead animals. So this Enlil, who's really known as Yahweh in the Bible, never wanted to eat the animals; he only wanted the vegetables. So Cain thought that God was looking down on him and didn't like and didn't like him and loved his brother more. So he said, "Well, I'm just going to kill my brother." So he killed his brother. But the reason why I say this because then. Yahweh chose back up, was really Enlil, and he says, what have you done? I'm kicking you out of here. So Cain goes, well, if you kick me out of here, the people out there are going to kill me. Wait a minute, what people? <laughs> There's already <laughs> tens of thousands of people on this planet long before Adam and Eve even existed. Uh. So God put a mark on his head and sent them out there, and he said, you'll find your wife and so forth and so on, and you have the Canaanites. So the people already existed. So they realized that for Adam to procreate, he had to have a, another, another one just like himself, another homo sapiens sapien. So they put him under. They took bone marrow, and they took the DNA out of the bone marrow, and they created Eve from that. Okay. Then after they figured that part out, they realized, okay, great. We got to now do this over and over again because we can't make them back to back to back because we're going to create genetic mutations. Uh -huh. So Christians are running around thinking that all these people on earth came from two people. Let's try that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's try I know. it. I know. Listen, we wouldn't even have enough IQ to get on this cell phone call right now. We'd be dummies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we'd be very mutilated and retarded and we'd have malformed fingers and hands and everything. We, you know, we'd live short lives. You can't right. meet brother and sister all over and over and over and have a whole 7 billion people on the planet. So right. they replicated what they did with Adam and Eve with other females of the Anunnaki breed, and they kept doing it over and over until they can get some of the women to imp get impregnated by the men, and then they created this whole breeding program. Hmm. And that's how they did it. They didn't make Adam and Eve together back to back to create all these people. So Homo sapiens sapien, how we got here was 200,000 years ago, just as the Sumerian tablets claim, just as mainstream science also claims we arrived on the scene. Uh -huh. uh, and then they began to see us as a perfected level of worker so they started um what's the best word to use putting down the other home hominids slowly but surely getting rid of them you know what the i mean Neanderthal, Neanderthal, uh the the, the, um, the, the no, dissolvins all of them right, right right just cleaning them out however you want to call it killing them off whatever they would starve them they would dry out their crops they would do all kind of stuff torturous stuff to them uh to get rid of them and make room for us <clears throat> and that's how we took over or you know got a chance to take over the planet. Um, so antediluvial times, pre-flood, we were just pure slaves. We had no say-so in anything. After the flood, the Anunnaki decided to create these pharaonic bloodlines and, in the land of Kem. This is what's talked about in the, in the Emerald Tablets. Okay. And so after the flood, they said, okay, we're going to have a liaison between us and the people because it's going to be multitudes 
we can't sit here and talk to all these people. We can't deal with all these people. We got to have in-between, go-betweens. But the go-between has to be a direct descendant from us. Uh -huh. So they created demigods. They would make with a female human, and they would have, she would give birth to a half-human, half-Atlantean, or half Anunnaki, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And, and that's how we started populating the planet. So that's pretty much the story of how we got here. Wow. So where does Atlantis fit into that? Like, where was that, that happening? Okay, now, this is a very good question. The Anunnaki term is a general term for people that came from space. Okay. From any planet, from any, okay. not just Nibiru, from anywhere. But the people that specifically interacted with us and did this genetic modification, they were Atlanteans, the Atlantean civilization. Enki, uh, Enlil, Thoth, and all these guys, Marduk, who's also known as Amun Ra, and all these people, they were Atlanteans. And Atlantis had several capitals on Earth. The okay. ring city that went down that was just one of the capitals. Okay. There were several all around the planet, and Atlantis was a global civilization. Not just global, it was also interplanetary. They had the capability, they were living on Earth, they were living on the moon, and they were also living on Mars. They were living on moons of Saturn and Jupiter as well. Uh, and in these wars that they went to battle with over control of these tablets of destinies and all this other stuff and control of humans, they had wars spanning across our entire solar system, creating wreaking havoc in the area. Fascinating stuff, dude. So yeah. where do, yeah, um, so then there are, so a few things. Um, there's the people that come from Sirius. Yep. There's people that come from the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so are those both considered Anunnaki as well? That's right. All both considered Anunnaki. <clears throat> the Pleiades are shown more than any other star system on any of the ancient artifacts. I have probably about 200 ancient artifacts that I've collected now. And all, almost, I would say 40% of them have the depiction of the Pleiadian star system. <clears throat> and the ones that you can't really tell, it seems like they're pointing towards the Pleiades. And again, you have the people who say that they were seated here from the Pleiades. And what my research takes me into with these ancient texts, it shows that there was some type of a galactic war going on in the Pleiades. Okay. Now, this galactic war was so severe that the Abrama weapon was used, which is a planetary destroyer, a, a Death Star. And it started blowing up planets. And that debris was floating around and crashing into other inhabited planets, creating a big problem in the area, in that region of space, in that sector of the galaxy. And whoever was advanced enough were getting on ships and fleeing. There were space refugees literally fleeing this war. Wow. Some went to, ended up in the Orion. Some ended up in Aldebaran. Some ended up in Sirius. <clears throat> some ended up even crash landing on a planet that orbited a brown dwarf star. That planet ended up, be called, uh, ended up being called Nibiru. <clears throat> so okay. you have all these various planets that they went to. They fleed and some ended up here and there and everywhere else. <clears throat> and this is why the Great Pyramid at Giza has shafts that point directly to Orion, Sirius, Aldebaran. You know, it points to these planets. It's, it's for recognition of where their ancestors are and where their people live. Also, communication. Because the Great Pyramid is a multifunctional stone computer with communication capabilities through the hydrogen frequency. And it would send these hydrogen frequency signals through those shafts directly to those star systems, star systems when it was in alignment. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, Thoth, Thoth was the son of an Atlantean priest. Yeah. Right? And so was right. he one of these demigods? No, he was actually a full-blown Atlantean Anunnaki. Okay. His, dad is, his dad is Enki. Oh, his so, father is Enki. Yeah, his father's Enki, and his brother is Marduk, who's in the modern-day Bible and a lot of other religious texts. That's Amun-Ra. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, Thoth is brother of, uh, uh, brother is Marduk, Amun Ra, and his, their dad is Enki. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So then, so Atlantis is being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And in the Emerald Tablets, Thoth gets into his ship and he yeah. sends his, his disciples or his guys to each sort of corner of the earth, correct? Right. And yeah. is that how we get this sort of global picture of all of these ancient texts that line up and sort of tell the same story? Because in my view, 
<clears throat> reading the Emerald Tablets and then understanding, yeah. you know, these synergies between ancient yeah. uh, cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, he sent, you know, people in South America, uh, yeah. people in Central America, the Aztecs, mm -hmm. the Incas, you know, then there's the Druids and uh, et cetera. And, the, and then to yeah. Asia, I'm assuming, and Africa. Yeah. So as he went to Egypt or Chem, yeah, which I guess that's Cairo. Chem is ancient Cairo. The land of Chem, that's, that's the full area of Egypt. Okay. <clears throat> you know, um, Cairo became the capital or a term, a name for a capital of that area many, many thousands of years later. Uh, you know, but uh, originally it's just the land of Chem, which is where we get chemistry and alchemy from. The Greeks uh -huh. renamed it to Egypt, where he kept though, but then we now call it Egypt. Gotcha. So is yeah. my understanding of that uh, situation correct? Yeah, pretty close. So what happens is antediluvial times before the Great Flood, there were Sumerian kings ruling over the planet for thousands of years each reign. Even Thoth ruled for 14,000 years over the land of Chem right. before the flood came down. After the flood happened, uh, he was, uh, you know, they all went away to, to safety. His dad says, okay, go back and let's rebuild, let's re-kickstart civilization. Go back to Chem first and start there. So he gets in the ship, <clears throat> he gets his crew, he goes to Chem. The barbarians are there. They're trying to attack right. him. He, subdu he subdues them and he talks to them and he says, we're going to raise you back up. Then he, after, they do, after they create the civilization again in the Chem, he says to his crew, okay, you go here, you go there, you go there. You got everybody spread out. Duplicate what we did here. So yeah. they spread out around the planet and duplicated the raising the level. This is why you see the same architecture, the same building techniques, the same pyramid structures and everything all over the planet on these energy grids and everything else because all the knowledge went with them when they spread out. Also, what you're going to find is <clears throat> the difference in races occurred around this time. So what happens is I'm not black because my ancestors hung out in the sun all the time and we had to become <laughs> black people. Uh huh. This is what they teach you in school. It's right, crazy. Right, this, man. Even as a kid, I said, this is stupid. It doesn't really make right? sense. doesn't make any sense, right? So I'm going, this is total garbage. And so as I got into biology and researching deeper, you will find in mainstream science and actually peer-reviewed science, I should say, that there's a 2% variance in the races. And oh. that, takes, that would take literally millions and millions of years to develop just through regular evolution. So 200,000 years for me to be black and you to be Caucasian, whatever you are, it can't happen. This is genetically done on purpose. And what I found in my personal theory, just me, is that when they spread out this crew that he had, they put their genetic marker on the people that they ruled over, like a cow brand. Uh. So the brand for the people of Cam was, were black. The brand for the people of Asia was their yellow. The brand for the, for the indigenous people of North America's you know, they were red. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. This is your brand. You're, look, you're ruling over these people. You're, you're, you're their God in that area. They're calling you God. You're ruling over them. And you've branded them. Everybody knows these are my people. You know, these are my chosen ones, my chosen people. You always hear this in the Bible. It's where it's from. And I, my theory is that when they spread out, they genetically marked people that they were ruling over. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so in my view... It seems like, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't done enough of my own digging into this to understand the full picture, but it seems as though, you know, since the dawn of man, mm -hmm. we have been, maybe just naturally because of the sort of uh, inescapable truth or the sort of domineering nature of human consciousness yeah. and the human spirit like we're sort of inconquerable in a mm -hmm. way and the anunnaki kind of created this thing that they couldn't uh control right so they sort of you know they set out to create a slave race that they could use mm -hmm. to do all the work for them right. and that our consciousness sort of started overriding all of that and yeah so, you see there's a problem with that yeah, so I look at that, and, uh, and I think that's really beautiful how you talk about, you know, the Great Awakening and, you know, continue to spread the light because more and more people are waking up, etc. And I yeah. see that myself. 
Um, you know, and I can sort of, so in that translation of it, I view the Anunnaki as sort of the villains of the story, but both seems like he was sort of a light bringer yeah. to, the, to yes. the people. Is that correct? And the Emerald Tablets That's are correct. an awakening uh, text. Yeah. That's exactly correct. You hit it right on the head, man. Both was one of those people that was like, you know what? Not, not only do I have empathy for these humans, I love them. He actually had a human wife at one point. Huh. The pyramid of the moon he built in Teotihuacan dedicated to his wife. That's his wife's pyramid. Um, and she was a human. And um, he was the bringer of knowledge to and language to people all over the entire planet. Not only on this planet, but even other planets. He uh -huh. would travel to other planets and he would watch civilizations rise and fall and try to bring enlightenment and understanding to hominids, sentient hominids all throughout the universe or within his reach. Mm. Um, you know, and that's really I mean, a beautiful thing. I mean, him and his father, his father who saved Noah, who's really Zuzudra or, Eb or Gilgamesh from the flood because it was Enlil's wish to have everybody slaughtered and died off. But, you know, but because, uh, you know, Noah was really half human and half, you know, Hanunaki, he was really, and, and he's uh, another half of a son, really. He saved him and spared him. So they really had fallen or had gotten attached to the human species. And what they, what Enki did was he added a little something extra in his genetic modification that he was doing. He was the master geneticist. And his brother Enlil found out that he had given us a little extra, more than what we were supposed to get in terms of our ability to excel and succeed consciously and raise ourselves to the next level. And Lil got mad at him, and they had a big battle over it mm. um, because he realized that what he did to us, he gave us the capability of not only meeting and matching where they are, but even surpassing them. Mm. That information from the tablets made it into the Bible where the, the, the angels became jealous of humans, God's right. creation, yes. because we had the ability to be more than them. Yes. And we had all these extra abilities that were untapped yet to find, and we were going to grow and develop and ascend, ascend and everything else, and they had a cap on what they could do. Wow. And so that, that's where that came from in the Bible. That came from the Sumerian story. It didn't come from, you know, it's not angels, it's aliens is what it is. Right, right, right. Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that's where it came from. And so he gave us a little extra, and we really do have the capability of, ascending far beyond where they are now an evidence of this is the tower of babel incident mm, okay. okay so we're building this tower into the heavens when what we're doing is we're duplicating something we saw the anunnaki do because we're doing it as a cargo cult either they were building a spaceport or a tower or a high-rise building who knows whatever it was right we copied it right <laughs> yeah now this yahweh character from the bible who's also known as enlil the evil one he goes away from time to time like they all do. He comes back. He sees this tower. He goes, wait a minute. What the hell's going on? The people are, are doing something. They're working in unison. They're working together. They're achieving a goal and they're building something technological. He gets angry. He destroys the tower. Yeah. This is how I knew as a little kid, I couldn't have been more than five or six years old when I read this in the Bible. I said, oh, this is not the creator of the universe. Uh, Doesn't make any sense. The creator of the universe is not going to disrupt work of people that are doing something uh, in honor of, of them and doing something nicely and properly and yeah. in peace. Yeah. That's when I knew right away it was a major flaw in this book. So anyway, he destroys the tower. Then he says something interesting in the Sumerian tablets, but then it made it to the Bible. My seed shall not abide in man forever. His year shall be 120. So what does that mean? Look into modern day science, Harvard University. They just discovered that the maximum lifespan of a human being under the most pristine conditions is 120 years. If they weren't poisoning us with all this stuff and these bad GMO seeds yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Um, and then they found out why. Because chromosome number two, somewhere around a couple hundred thousand years ago, was fused together. And two caps were putting on the end of chromosome number two in the human body, limiting our lifespan. We used to live for thousands of years before that. At that point, when he did that to us, he cut our lifespan down to 120 max. Wow. Max. And this has now been verified by modern day science. And the time frame that it's done in, it adds up. And they can't figure out who did it or how it was done. Scientists just say, this was like laboratory work. Somebody did this a pur purposeful act to give us this, these telomere caps. Wow. So they started researching them. 
this is crazy stuff. Yeah. And they said, wait a minute, let's do, let's see if we can stop this from happening on mice. So they started genetically modifying the mice. Then they took those telomere caps in the mice and they stopped them from shrinking. So a telomere cap is yes. genetic material that's passed on in DNA and cell replication. Yes. But the problem is just like a buffer on YouTube, when the buffer runs out and then the video ends, the video is finished. Uh huh. That's what happens in our body. So when the buffer material in those caps runs out, we begin the death process. Mm. Okay? So they found a way to stop this from happening in mice. And they were able to get the mice to live three times, three lifespans, three lifetimes. How did they do that? Is that through C60? I don't know the exact uh, genetic uh, modification that they did to stop it or what chemical compound they used. But they, the articles are available online. If you yes. Google telomeres, uh, Harvard. Them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, whatever that was, if that was it, it stopped it. And now, if they can do that to my, mice, they can do it with human beings. Yes, you it's a, it's a carbon molecule called C60. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the guy, do you know David Wolf? Yes, David Wolf, Avocado Wolf. Yeah. Absolutely. He's started. He's starting to bottle this. He, you, you can wow. go and purchase this supplement. Wow. He, he talks about C60, and it's called. I think they've even called it Buckminster Fullerene. Oh, wow. After the great scientist. And they've yeah. done studies with this chemical compound. It's a carbon molecule, specific mm -hmm. carbon molecule, C60, that they've yeah. given to mice. And they've literally increased their lifespan by three times. And he says that that's only because they had to kill them. They had to kill the mice because they were living for so long. Wow. So that's fascinating, dude. And it, you wow. know, it, it speaks to this idea, um, you know, in our, in this modern civilization, we find ourselves in everyone's dying for the scientific evidence of it. Yeah. And yet I, here we find ourselves in this position where science continues to prove spiritual, spiritual truths, you know, and universal yeah. truths. Yep. Um, that's right. Dude, it's amazing. I want to talk to you about uh, another thing. You know, I played in the NFL, okay. and uh, I came out of my football career, and I really sort – I very organically got into cannabis advocacy. Okay. And cannabis I used throughout my football career, and I feel that, you know, intuitively, I believe mm -hmm. it really helped me preserve my health, my brain health, et cetera. Yeah. And coming out of my career, I found out that the federal government has a patent on cannabinoids, the chemical mm -hmm. compounds found in the cannabis plant, as neuroprotectants and antioxidants. Yep. So they have actually seen in scientific studies that this stuff protects our brain cells and mm -hmm. can help our brains heal. And, you know, football players, the number one issue is concussions and CTE or chronic traumatic yep. encephalopathy. That's right. So I became very passionate about spreading this message. And, you know, I, I wanted to learn and understand everything I could about the cannabis plant and our endocannabinoid system, et cetera, yeah. and how it works in our bodies. And, you know, I'm doing all this digging and I come to this story a couple years ago and it's about this French explorer who stumbled upon the Dogon tribe in West Africa. Yeah. And he go and this is probably like I, I'm not positive on the date, but it must have been mid 1800s, sometime in there, mid to late 1800s. He stumbled upon the Dogon tribe, and um, they're in West Africa, and he he uh, he meets with the chiefs and the elders of the tribe, and they yeah. take him to these caves where they've done all of these elaborate paintings of the constellations and the star system, and they've drawn out Sirius A and B. And yeah. at a time when science, uh, you know, the, the science scientific community hadn't even seen this stuff yet. Yep. And then it came to be true, like once we could see it through telescopes, etc. Mm -hmm. And it proved that these people had this. And this tribe has an annual cannabis festival. They yeah. celebrate when the beings from the Sirius star, the dog mm -hmm. star, came yeah. down and brought them the cannabis plant and said, this plant will bring you peace and it will, you know, it will sustain you. 
Yep. And That's so right. cannabis, two dogs. Cannabis, when you break it down, cannabis means two yep. dogs from the two dog stars, Sirius A and B. Yep. And I yep. thought that was fucking mind blowing. And then I, I'm watching this this uh, uh, ancient aliens show, and it talks about how uh, this word Dogon it it stretches across all cultures. Like in yep. Ireland, there's uh, the dogba. Uh, in yeah. Japan, the dragon people, that's like the root word of dogma or uh, dogon, etc. Dog. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So can you talk a little, how do they fit into this sort of, uh, this puzzle? Are they Anunnaki yeah. as well? Yeah, they're Anunnaki as well. They came from the, uh, the dark star. And what's so amazing is the, the dogon called them the nomo. Okay, that was their name. They gave, he gave them the name, the, the Nomo. They, 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 they likened them to fish people. That was really just their outfit that they had on. Mm. You know, again, we have limited perception of mm. what we see when we don't understand technology. We don't understand these spacesuits yeah. and everything else. These people had the ability to dive underwater. They probably maybe, maybe even made an underwater base. Uh -huh. So to the Dogon, it was like, these are fish people. You know, right, right. but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were Anunnaki that came probably again, peoples who had left out of the, you know, even further back out of the Pleiades and ended up in Sirius. Unfortunately, the star that they, the planet that they arrived to and had inhabited probably for millions of years, uh, ended up the star ran out of fuel. So they got to a star, uh, you know, that, that didn't have much time left. And, uh, so that star ran out of fuel. It became a white dwarf. And the, they even told the Dogon that our star is so heavy, uh, even though it's collapsed in on itself, the gravitational force is so heavy that every single person on this planet couldn't lift one tablespoon of it. So the Dogon even knew that and told that to the scientists. We just learned about that about 20, 30 years ago, you know? Uh, it's amazing. They also told them every shape, size, and color of every planet in our entire solar system. So they had all that knowledge. They knew about Neptune. They knew it was on its side. They knew the color. They knew all this stuff about in, in intricate details. And of course, they even knew that Sirius was a trinary star system that had three stars orbiting each other in a very yeah. strange orbit. And of course, the one star that they had died, which um, nobody could see until the 1970s with a modern day observatory. But then we could finally see the actual dead star. You know, so they knew about this, and it's in their oral history that they've handed down. Right. And they have this one elder that hand, that keeps the knowledge. He's like the, a human library. Yeah. And they keep him separate from everybody in this one castle. And if any human being touches him, he must be killed immediately. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he can't tainted. be allowed to be defiled. Yeah, he can't be tainted. Right, exactly. You know, yeah. it's an amazing thing. And they have no crime. They have no arrests. They have no jail, no prison. Everything is worked out and negotiated on the spot. Mm. Uh, and they live in total peace and tranquility. This is and, the but Dogons. they have this information. The Dogons, yes. Now, yeah. the Dogons, what's interesting, the Dogons were the original inhabitants of the land of Cam. That's oh. where they started. Interesting. Yes, they were the original inhabitants. What happened was, see, Cam, unfortunately, was overthrown seven times. Mm. This is why you see many different races in Egypt. Uh -huh. The people who are pro one race and pro one race, they all, oh, it's always, it's, it was always white. Oh, it was always uh, Arab. No, it was always black. No, it was a mix. Uh. It started off with the land of Cam, anti diluvial, uh, yeah, anti post diluvial. So we're talking about after the flood, uh -huh. all black, well documented. <laughs> Sumerian tablets called them the black face people. You have all the kings that are uh, there, even some of the ones that have been discovered that are in the Cairo Museum that I've seen with my own eyes. There are black people laying on the table, mummies out there out for the world to look at, which I don't kind of agree with, but whatever. Yeah. But they were overthrown seven times. You've had Arabs, you've had Greeks, you've had uh, Assyrians, you've had all these different people ruling over Egypt, uh, you know, the name change. That's fascinating. All these different capitals. Yeah, the capital moved from place to place. It didn't stay in one place. Uh, you know, so it was it was uh, an evolving trend, the situation of this pharaonic line as it evolved and changed. Even at the end, Alexander the Great ended up becoming a pharaoh there. Right. You know, and that was the last reign and the pharaonic bloodlines that were remaining. They had started migrating across uh, into Arabia and then into eventually into Europe, where they ended up mating with the people from the Caucasus Mountains, becoming more Caucasian. 
Mm. This is why you have the king and the queen and the monarchy and everything else appearing to be Caucasian, but always sporting Egyptian motif and Egyptian themes on everything. Yeah. Because their their direct bloodline goes all the way back to the Egyptians. And as Egyptians go back to the Kemenites or the Kemetics, and that goes back to the Sumerian kings list in Oxford, Oxford, England. But these Nomo came here and they taught mankind a lot of information, a lot of stuff, primarily the ones in the land of Kem, which lets me know it's the same Atlantean people. All this, this beacon had gone off. We found this planet. This is an oasis. This is a great place for experiments, a great place for this, a great place for mining resources, a great mm -hmm. place to visit. Yeah. And people were coming here, you know what I'm saying? And they were checking it out. Uh, and they brought on a lot of knowledge and wisdom with them. And our ancient ancestors recorded all of this verbally and also in stone and also obviously in caves as well. Fascinating stuff, man. Um, so what right now on this planet, what is the oldest text that you can, uh, that is tangible, that you can go and seek out? To me, the oldest text would be the um, Emerald Tablets of Thoth, the plural version, the Emerald Tablets. There's uh -huh. an Emerald Tablet of Hermes, which is in the Cambridge Library. It uh -huh. was translated by last by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh -huh. okay? But he did 40, 44 books of works that he wrote himself. He didn't have a scribe write these. The Book Hermes. of Thoth is still Hermes, yes, who's also uh, Thoth. Is he... Um... But I think different uh, groups sort of believe different things, but was Hermes the reincarnation of Thoth? Yeah, so Thoth had reincarnated many times. Right. According to the Animal Tablets, he had come back, uh, you know, at least over 10,000 years, 100 times. Uh -huh. You know, he would send a body into this halls of a menti chamber underneath right. the Great Pyramid and rejuvenate a body, and he'd transfer his consciousness into another body. Yeah. They, and these bodies weren't other people. They were bodies that they created themselves. It says specifically, we created these bodies. In other words, they made clones. Uh -huh. And then after these clones, they would transfer their conscience, kind of like, like the Avatar movie. They would just put conscience right. into it. They would walk around and they said, we would walk amongst men, but unlike a man. Uh -huh. But they weren't taking over bodies. They were making their own bodies and inhabiting those. And then when that wore out, they'd put it in a rejuvenation chamber and get in and hop in another one. Like, you know, just changing spare tires. Kind of, you know, right. Okay. right. You know, and but he would incarnate many times. He was Thoth, Tehuti, Tehuti, Odin, Mercury, uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl, Veracocha, Lord Pakal, Kukulkan. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Lots of names. Fascinating stuff, man. I highly yeah. recommend for anyone out there, if you're inclined to seeking out universal truths, man, check out the Emerald Tablets. Yeah. Um, Powerful. Uh, there's something else I wanted to, I mean, dude, we hit so much. I mean, one thing I, I really appreciate about your work, man, is um, a couple of years ago, my grandmother turned me on to uh, my lineage and my family history. Wow. And uh, she sent me all these documents talking about my first American ancestor, this woman named Mary Bliss Parsons. Who mm. came to America from England in 1637. Uh, she was, her and her husband founded a town in Massachusetts called Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, wow. She was a witch. She was on trial for witchcraft three times, got off wow. each time. There were stories of the feuds she had with the people in her town. All the women thought she was constantly trying to seduce their men. Uh, <laughs> children died. She went to farms. And when she left, like all the cattle would be dead and all these stories about her. She lived to be uh, in her 80s. She had 11 kids. One of them was named Eben, who was killed in a battle with Indians. And they said that was her karma for dealing mm. with on the dark side. Um, and there are a handful, there's an anthology of books about her diaries that she kept. And she talks about uh, how our ancestors come from the Pleiades mm. and all of this information. And it's just yeah. like, you know, yeah. putting this stuff into context because, you know, I mean, believe what you want. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to... If you want to um, 
live in this very limited view of this human experience. That's fine. But there's so much that we don't understand and that we don't know. And that's kept from us, you yep. know, and that's not acknowledged, you know, by the establishment. I, I've, I've come to call it the establishment, especially in this <laughs> time of coronavirus, man. You know, it's like you can't really trust anything coming out of the mainstream media at this point. That's know. right. If you ever could, you know. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. So, you know, you talk about the dark brotherhood, like, you know, yeah. doing, oh, everything, that's them. doing everything it can. So in your view, just before we run out of here, man, yeah. in your view, who is sort of, you know, because we live in this, you know, even our, our existence as individuals is tempered by the dark and the light, you know? And it's sort of in, you know, when you were talking to me about the history of Anki and Enlil and their relationship, it almost seems like they were sort of the two sides of the coin that were infused into the creation of man. Um, So nowadays, like when we're talking about this dark side or the darkness or dark brotherhood or, you know, the the powers that be that are trying to keep us asleep and keep us, uh, you know, living this very, um, you know, mediocre, uh, unfulfilling existence. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the blood, the bloodline, the offspring of, or the Rakam, as in ancient text, of these ancient Anunnaki Atlantean people. Their bloodline is still here on this planet, it's still running and ruling. The elite families, which are the top 100 families that control and run 7.7 billion people right now. Mm-hmm. We have 7.7 billion people on Earth as of two weeks ago, and we're all being controlled by less than 100 families. It's really a shame. That bloodline could be traced all the way back to these, uh, you know, these Sumerian kings. Yeah. Um, even the presidents of the United States are all related by blood. Through the mother's side, they all can be traced back, including President Obama, whose mother is a Caucasian woman named Stanley Ann Dunham. The only, only president we had that wasn't in the direct bloodline but was still related to royalty out of France was Van Buren. They didn't have a suitable puppet that election, I guess. But every single president, and it's not just my research. This has now been done yes. by thousands of researchers. You know, yes. <laughs> yeah. I've seen this. Now, when I was... Yeah, when I was doing this six years ago and bringing this information out, people were calling me a whack job and a psycho and a pseudoscientist and all this other stuff. <laughs> and I was reaching, I was fabricating and making things up. And now all of a sudden, mainstream this TV is saying, oh, yeah, and then you have Obama. Oh, yeah, I'm Dick Cheney's cousin. Oh, yeah, I'm Bush's cousin on national TV. And they all admit it now. You know, Donald Trump, he's related to Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton are actually cousins. Oh, God. They're cousins of each other. This is the craziest thing. That's how come she was able to potentially win the presidency, which she actually did win, but they gave it to Trump with the electoral vote. So nobody's vote really counts anyway. But that, that bloodline is still running and controlling this planet till this very day. And in my opinion, there'll be no massive change in this, on this planet and no interaction from other beings that are much more benevolent um, until we grow up a little bit. They're watching us. We've got 7.7 billion people being controlled by 100 families, and they're saying they're not ready for us yet. Mm. When they mature enough to realize that race and color and and, and, and differences and all this stuff got to go to the wayside, they got to learn how to love one another and join forces as one human species on this planet and then overthrow these oligarchs that are controlling everything they see, hear, smell, touch, feel, read, and understand, when they can do that, then they're ready to start walking. Right now, they're barely crawling. Wow. And, you know, so the mission now for me has always been, how can I continue to spread the message? How can I make it duplicatable where other people can continue to spread little by little to get this mass effect of awakened conscious beings on the planet uh, to where we can begin to realize all this divide and conquer has just really destroyed us for generations. We got to come together and we have to uh, overthrow these people. And there's only one way to do the overthrow. You can't do it through war. You can't do it through picketing and crying on TV. You have to stop participating. Yeah. Yeah. When that happens, game over. 
I love game that, over. Dude. Now we've that's proven good. we can stop participating. <laughs> wow, dude, that's so powerful. You say that, man, because that's really, you know, I've really had, I've experienced a, a deep, a deep um, purging of emotions over this last, you know, couple wow. months in this coronavirus thing, and uh, and what I've really come to because you know I've been wrapped up in sort of the fear of what these people are going to try to do to us and you know forget about the coronavirus like I, yeah. you know that's the least of my concerns you know i'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm more concerned with like sort of the future of humanity coming mm -hmm. out of this this just right. fear this fear war that you know the establishment has put us under and yeah. you know i'm i'm like on social media, I'm like fighting with people to help them to like, because I'm trying to prove my truth and, yeah. you know, and, and I realized, you know, the conflict only lasts as long as you participate in it. That's it. <laughs> it's like, that's it. Literally. Oh, go? and you just like, you know, and this idea of like, you know, yeah, stop participating, you know, That's stop it, playing the game and there is no yeah. game, you know, and That's it right. all just kind of like dissolves. It dissolves, man. We've proven that we can stop participating because coronavirus, coronavirus forced us to stop participating. And guess yeah. what? We're alive. We're yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. So if that's the case, why don't we join consciously and we coordinate 300 million people not going to work on Monday, 300 million people taking all their money out of the bank on Monday. 300 million people not making a mortgage payment, not making a car payment, not making a student loan payment, mm. not participating in the system. Let's, you know what? Let's not buy gas for one week. Let's everybody just not buy gas for one week. Stay home. Mm. Well, you prepare for something like this. You stock up and you have food ready to go. And on the day that's appointed, we're done, guys. And this includes so many people. It would even include people in the military, people in the, people in the police force, people in the court system. People will be, just be like, we're done. And yeah. when everybody stops participating, they're going to beg for us to do something. And now yeah. we negotiate on our terms. We put in the system that we want to have put in. We take away this capitalistic society, which destroys and tortures men worldwide. And we install something better, you know? Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. it, dude. What a, great, what a great sentiment to end on, brother. Yeah. Hey, You're man. The man Thank dude. You. Hey, Billy, uh, is there anything you want to shout out to the audience before we get out of here? Yeah, you know, I just launched Forbidden Knowledge TV. So uh, 4BK, the number 4BK.TV or ForbiddenKnowledge.TV, streaming platform, conscious content, documentaries, movies, episodes, series, over a thousand episodes of content up there right now. And you can try it free for three days if you like it. You keep it. If you don't like it, you don't have to keep it. It's only 25 cents a day thereafter. If you keep it, seven bucks and 77 cents a month. And also every month, every single subscriber is automatically entered into a contest drawing to win a brand new iMac computer. We already gave away two. Uh, so, you know, if anybody wants to try it out, it's great. Awesome, man. Um, I'll have all that in the show notes as well. Thank you. When the episode comes out. Billy, dude, right. you're the man. I really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Absolutely, man. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this very special episode of the Ebb and Flow podcast. I am your host, Eben Britton. I pray that you're staying safe, sane, stay in the light, stay in the positivity. We're going to get through this together, everybody. Let's stop participating and let's, let's live this life the way it's meant to be lived. Lots of love to you all. Peace.